This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. And at the recent Discovery Leadership Summit 2016, a whole host of speakers, including Simon Cooper, who has written Soconomics as well as other books. He's also a columnist for the Financial Times. He's a guy who knows football backwards. And we were chatting at the presentation at the Discovery Leadership Summit. Our glorious football stadiums have been a complete waste of time. It's devastating. The sad thing is, not that I'm a genius, but I knew this before the World Cup, that those stadiums will become white elephants, because every sports economist I spoke to was telling me that. And through, you know, I wrote Soconomics with a sports economist, and he said, These, this World Cup is going to produce no legacy for South Africa, the stadiums will be useless, and it's a very sad waste of money in a country with so many other needs. And I was very surprised that most South Africans bought the government story that this would kickstart the economy, etc. Mm, oh, well, look, I mean, we had fun for about three weeks um, in 2010, and we've watched them wither away. We got, we got, uh, we got you two into the into the FNB Stadium, but I think that's the last time it got used. Maybe by the Eagles as well and some local soccer. But you did pay tribute to a man called John Perlman with his Dream Fields project, which you say has actually done a lot more work for soccer development in South Africa than FIFA ever. Uh, ever has and that's an indictment on the whole deal that was struck for the World Cup 2010. Yeah I mean FIFA made billions out of the World Cup mostly in TV rights. South Africa had to spend all the money building the stadiums. A good FIFA would have said guys we're going to take those billions and we're going to build sports fields for kids all over Africa mostly all weather fields where the local kids can go and play every day. You'd also see that South African football would become much better. Yeah. You would start producing more stars and people would just have fun it would make them happy and it would have been so easy and really quite cheap. And instead, you spent those millions, those billions of rand on these useless stadiums in places like Nail Sprouts. You have two stadiums side by side in Durban. You have a football stadium that nobody needed in Cape Town. And it, it almost makes me want to cry. And John Perlman with Dreamfields mm. has done exactly the right thing. He said, what South Africa needs is places for kids to play soccer. Simple as that. Um, was FIFA ever a good organisation, a noble organisation. I think a lot of people have lost faith in the FIFA organisation. I don't think there was a golden age, but there was an age without money. Uh, until the 70s, TV rights in football were peanuts. And so if you ran FIFA, it was really like running a small charity. You know, you organised the World Cup, you know, it was a lot of old, old white gentlemen in suits, uh, racists, etc. But they weren't stealing money because there wasn't mm. any money. And uh, they were racist and pompous, but they, they kind of had their hearts in the game, as it were. And then when money started coming in the 70s, people who wanted to steal some money were attracted to FIFA because it's an easy mm -hmm. thing to do. I mean, if, if you're running FIFA, you three guys in a cash box in Zurich, not much scrutiny, and now you have billions coming in. But that has changed. I mean, does FIFA, does the nature of FIFA change? Huge scrutiny, the arrests, Jack Warner's great revelations, and the multiple the stories that have been written since then, including work by yourself? Yeah, I think that it's going to be harder for them to steal money now. And Switzerland also is no longer turning a blind eye. Switzerland is saying, guys, we don't want you to do this on Swiss territory anymore. So I think the people who, you know, stuck all the money in their back pockets, a lot of them have been rolled up and others have been scared. But you still have these out-of-touch old men flying around the world first class and getting these amazing, you know, daily stipends um, to do not very much for football. So, I mean, for example, say they build a field in Africa, you know, one, and they do it with huge uh, hullabaloo and FIFA's mm. builds a football field. But most of the money is spent on flying them back and forth first class to that field and mm. then getting a four-wheel drive car to take the football official out to open the field. Um, that's where most of the money goes, not on building the field. Mm. Um, but football, despite FIFA, football is probably stronger than it's ever been before. Is that a fair comment? It's more popular, yeah. <coughs> because football, its growth is driven by TV. Um, more and more people around the world can watch live football on TV and until now, that might change, but until now live football has worked brilliantly on TV. So Manchester United used to be a club in Manchester, became a club in England and now they're a club in the world. Mm. And Manchester United exist as fully in Soweto as they do in Manchester. Now, one of the interesting observations that you've made is that the nature of TV watching is changing. Very few people watch TV live anymore, even sports events, which were sacrosanct. Um, at one point, people would sit down at the beginning of the game and might, at halftime might go and have, make a cup of tea and then come back for the second half. That dynamic could be changing. It could be. I mean, there's worrying signs for sport in collapsing TV audience, declining 20% down Premier League viewing in Britain, NFL, American football, 12% down. This is the last couple of months in the US. And it's worrying that the smartphone 
is more entertaining to people than watching 90 minutes of soccer. And if people no longer watch the, want to watch the 90 minutes of soccer, the soccer economy is going to shrink. Um, and if it does that, what happens then to this great dream of global football? Well, you'll still have it. You'll still have Manchester United being kind of watched in South Africa and in China, but maybe just in very short videos that don't pay United as much money as the 90-minute game sold to cable TV channels with mm. lots of subscribers. Which begs the question then, in the world of Twitter and short attention spans and multiple options available in the palm of your hand at relatively small cost, does the game of football have to evolve to maintain its relevance? I actually think football is more easily packaged in one minute videos because 90 minutes of football frankly always was a bit boring but we were just used to watching long boring tv programs you spent half your did. life <laughs> watching football writing about football talking about football and it's boring very often being bored by football i remember i was in pretoria watching paraguay japan at the world cup here and it was the dullest game imaginable <laughs> and i was sitting there thinking are 100 million people around the world really watching this live? Yes, they are. And why? I just couldn't for the life of me. And I think those 100 million people now think, you know what, I'll get my one minute mm. highlight loop of Paraguay, Japan, that's enough. Um, uh, the world of technology is also changing the game. Maradona would never have had the hand of God had we had the, 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 the third umpire, for example. Is that destroying the game? Uh, you still get a lot of, you know, hand of God moments. Um, it's not very tough, the kind of technological refereeing. Uh, football's very reluctant to change because football says rightly, look, we're a success. The whole world watches us. Why would we want to change a product that works? Until that product stops working, I think you're going to see football remain very cautious about making any changes at all. Okay, so football is not going to make any changes, but the world of media is changing and is going to change the nature of football. You've got eight-year-old twins, football fans. I mean, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. How are they consuming football now? Well, we give them an hour of TV on a weekend day. One hour on yeah. a weekend. You're yeah, a good and, dad. Yes. Well, then it, it kind of leaks out, say, into one hour 20. But, okay. Uh, we try and limit. And so they turn on the match, or I turn on the match. And they start watching the match, and then they think, this is a bit boring, on the iPad, uh, Paul Pogba video. They live in France, big Pogba fans, or uh, the 10 worst free kicks in history. And they watch that, and they talk about that. They'll tell me, do you know what Pogba did in this match once? And they're not saying, oh, you know, I feel Manchester United declined a bit in the second half, because that's too boring. Why mm -hmm. do they want to watch that? So, I mean, post-match reviews, all of that stuff is, uh, what, gone in five years? Do you know, I look at my boys, and they don't know any managers. Um, they don't care who's the United manager, who's the city manager. But in the 21st century, the, a manager's life expectancy is the equivalent of an RAF pilot in World it's War II. Yes. I mean, it, it's a, a, a brutally short period of time. Yeah, and more and more we're realising the manager doesn't actually have much impact. And I think one reason we cared so much, my generation, about managers is that when we began televising press conferences, you got some very entertaining managers, you know, characters, Mourinho, Ferguson, mm. Wenger. And the footballers in England weren't allowed to speak, so the managers spoke, and they were very entertaining. And so we, the media, began to fixate on them. Mm. But now, you know, you have one-minute videos on YouTube, and that's more entertaining than a manager's press conference. So I, was, I think we're seeing the media move in a, more, in a new direction. Often when you read newspaper reports still, the press conference is bigger than the game. It's more yeah. interesting than the game. So the newspaper match report is about the press conference, it's not about the match. Mm, which is, which is, is sad for aficionados of the game, like yourself. But there are not many aficionados. Most football fans mm. actually don't care that much about the game as it's played on the field. How does that make you feel, though, for somebody who's dedicated his life to telling the story of this, of, of, of this game? I'm also interested in the characters, and I'm interested in why people watch the anthropology of you, Are you an anthropologist by training? No, but my dad oh. is. My father okay. grew up in Johannesburg as an anthropologist by training, and he kind of taught me to see the world as a foreigner, as an anthropologist. Mm. So I'm fascinated by football culture, why people watch, how they watch. Um, I used to love football. I can't really say I love football anymore. Why not? I think I just got old. I think a lot, <laughs> of, a lot of my friends my age as well, if you're like me, you're 47, if you still desperately care whether your team wins on Saturday and you're in a bad mood and cursing if they don't, there's something wrong with you, really. You're you saying I'm old? Sorry? You're saying I'm old, because I haven't cared for 20 years. I'm too old to... I mean, I watch Chelsea Arsenal, I don't really watch it, but I hear people talk to me about Chelsea Arsenal, and I think, why would I care whether Arsenal wins or whether Chelsea wins? Why would... Why would 
I can see that eight-year-olds might mm. care, but why would any adult care? I don't, I don't quite understand that. But I'm fascinated that other people can. Yes. I mean, that's the anthropology of it. There's the technology of it as well, which is informing the way people play the games, the data analysis, which I think is what is captivating you now as to how teams are getting an edge over other teams. Because surely at some point, um, you can only buy so much talent and have so many uh, variations <coughs> of, uh, of 22 men running around a pitch for, for 90 minutes. Um, it, it's about the data and the analysis of that data, which gives teams the edge. Well, I mean, if you're Real Madrid, you don't have to worry that much about data because you can buy players who everyone knows are great. You buy Ronaldo, Gareth Bale, not much risk, not much need for data. If you're Leicester City, you don't have that much money. You can't say we're going to buy Ronaldo. So you have to say we're going to find a player who's been undervalued by everyone else using data. Now, what did Leicester City do? Because they won the premiership this yeah. year so famously. Everybody goes, oh, it's back to the roots of football. Your science tells you something different. It's not back to the roots of football at all. Leicester are modern. And so they used stats and they found this guy in the French second division nobody knew about, Riyad Mahrez, amazing attacking stats. A guy in the French second division, then French first division, nobody cared about him, N'Golo Kante. A guy who played in two defensive midfield positions at the same time. Uh, nobody covered more ground, nobody won more balls. And nobody had noticed him. So they bought these two guys for a pittance and they won them the league. That's data-driven thinking, that's not about heart and gut. But isn't that what gives football a future? Um, it's a way for a small club like Leicester to be more intelligent than the big clubs and to end up winning. Mm, Simon Cooper, thanks so much for your time and uh, welcome back in Johannesburg. You visited lots, your roots are here as well. It's nice to have you on The Moneymakers. Thanks very much. Simon Cooper, who's written the books Soconomics and others, plus of course for many years has covered fo uh, football, the game and the politics of football for the Financial Times. Thank you so much for watching The Moneymakers this evening. Good night. <laughs>